So I think we are all set to go. So good morning for anybody just joining us. My name is Annie Wheeler, and I'm very pleased to welcome everybody to our second session of Party Madagascar 2020 this morning. Before we get started, I do wanna go over some basics of this webinar, especially if you're not too familiar with Zoom. Our moderator and our panelists today will not be able to see your video or hear your audio, but we do have two other ways for you to communicate if you'd like to. You can either use the chat function towards the bottom of your screen to make casual comments throughout the event, or if you have a specific question that you want answered by our panelists or our moderator, you can use the Q&A function, which should be right next to that chat at the bottom. We are planning to have some time at the end of the event today to answer a few of your questions. So during today's event, we will be hearing from three conservation organizations and learning about how they are working together with local communities to restore degraded forest in Madagascar. And on that note, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, lemur-loving Len Bayer. So Len is a longtime trustee and past chairman of the board of the Seneca Park Zoo Society. Together with Lori, the Bayers have been active conservationists for many years. They are particularly interested in the need to save animals from extinction in Madagascar, where habitat destruction has been especially hard on the endemic fauna population. So Len, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna to hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone. <clears throat> Happy to be here moderating this uh, presentation and discussion by uh, groups vital to the reforestation of uh, Madagascar and the saving of uh, endemic animals from extinction. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many people uh, joining this discussion uh, and having uh, uh, the welfare of uh, exotic fauna uh, uh, so uh, near and dear to their hearts. So today we'll, we will be discussing how the degraded forests of Madagascar are being restored by engaging local communities, sustainable living, seeding programs, and local education. Our first panelist today is Rick Hudson from the Turtle Survival Alliance. Uh, Annie, go ahead with the first presentation. on Madagascar tortoises. So let's get to it. Uh, most of people uh, that are attending this event will understand the uh, threats at Madagascar or the importance of Madagascar in a biodiversity context. It's one of the world's leading biodiversity hotspots and conservation priorities, especially because of its high level of endemism. And that's especially true with primates where you've got entire genera and families only found in Madagascar. We're gonna focus on tortoises. And there are seven species of tortoises in Madagascar all of those are endemic. Um, with the challenges of Madagascar are well known. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, uh, but poverty is a major driver and political instability and corruption are major drivers of the poaching and illegal trade problems, which is really what we're going to focus on during this presentation. Um, the three species that we in particular focus on, the plowshare tortoise up in the northwest, uh, which is certainly recognized as the world's most endangered tortoise. The spider tortoise in the Southwest, three, three subspecies or three taxa of that uh, little dwarf tortoise. And then we're gonna mainly talk about the radiated tortoise, which is undergoing a severe systematic extermination. Um, the plowshare tortoise is really a species on the brink. Um, estimated population is less than 100. The species is functionally extinct in the wild. 100 is really a generous uh, estimate. It's uh, used to exist in some fragmented populations in, up in the Bali Bay. But right now, the species is, is essentially gone in Madagascar from the wild. Survival will depend on well-managed captive populations. Three subspecies or three species of uh, spider tortoises, uh, extremely fragmented now by habitat fragmentation and now collection for the international pet trade. We've seen about a 70% contraction of its historical range. The TSA maintains assurance colonies of all three of these groups. 
The radiated tortoise is really a, sto a story of systematic extermination. It's ranked critically endangered. How could it be critical when you see so many animals being confiscated? It's a rate of decline, which is truly staggering and really scary. Once was one of the most common and densely populated tortoises on earth. Conservative estimates put it at about 12 million. Uh, we, what we're seeing now reflects a population reduction of about 75%. And these populations decreases are due to deforestation of their spiny forest habitat and collection for the food and pet trade. Collection for the trade is their single greatest threat. Uh, and we're seeing, we've seen about a 65% range contraction of this species. Uh, since the uh, since since the 1860s, um, our footprint of conservation of tortoise conservation in Madagascar, we've just built or acquired a, a new facility in Tano, a nice office and, and tortoise facility where we is kind of our home base now. We have uh, four major facilities in the south: the Lavavulu Tortoise Center, which is where most of the tortoises ended up uh, from the big confiscation back in April of 2018. We've got the Tortoise Conservation Center in near Siombe, which is really the, the kind of the linchpin of our confiscation and reintroduction strategy. Then we've got a couple of smaller uh, rescue facilities. Um, poaching affects all species of Madagascan tortoises. Uh, they are protected, uh, but enforcement capacity is extremely lacking in Madagascar. In, uh, concurrently, we're seeing uh, smuggling efforts and trade routes are becoming more and more dynamic. They are driven by these highly organized poaching gangs. Tens of thousands are tortoises collected annually for export to international markets and an equal amount being slaughtered for bushmeat consumption by tribes outside of the core area. The, the tribes within the core area protect and rever the tortoise and don't harm them. It's the outside tribes that have consumed their tortoises that come in to poach. Um, what actions has TSA taken? Well, we receive, treat, and rehabilitate many, many tortoises collected from the illegal trade. We maintain over 24,000 uh, confiscated tortoises at our five facilities. We produce a lot of educational material for schools and community awareness. We actually build schools. We've built one so far. We were on track to build two more this year at our reintroduction sites. Those uh, plans were obviously delayed. Um, we work closely with the Madagascan government and law enforcement entities to uh, reduce poaching, to increase law enforcement, and to prosecute smugglers. We have a, a, a person in the South who is dedicated uh, to enforcement and has, uh, is really rigorous about chasing down poachers, apprehending them, and holding them until the, the gendarmes can arrive. We also develop assurance colonies for uh, things especially like uh, plowshare tortoises and spider tortoises. Um, the big one occurred in uh, 2018. Uh, over 10,000 radiated tortoises were seized in, in Tulier. Um, I'm sorry, that's supposed to be 2018. They were transferred to the Village de Tortue, which is a French-run facility near Tulier, for their for the works really where we staged the big event. 75 men and women gave medical and daily care to these tortoises over a three-month period, and over 70 organizations globally and 500 individuals supported this global relief effort. And I'm telling you, AZA Zoo stepped up really big. Uh, we could not have done this without the collective support of the, of the zoo and, and aquarium conservation community. Amazing job. The to these tortoises all now, uh, the, the, the survivors, which about 95% survived, now reside in safety at TSA Lava Bulu Tortoise Center. So there's just some images of the of the rescue itself, and you can just see this, you know, overwhelming, staggering number of tortoises. And just imagine coming in and trying to get your arms around, you know, soaking and re and rehabbing and, and getting food into all these tortoises. It's it's amazing. The bottom right photograph shows the extent of the Lava Bulu Center, and this was basically built out of a patch of desert during the big rescue. We we had all hands on deck building these walls uh, during that during that time. It's amazing commitment. Um, we, I want to wrap up just talking about our basic confiscation and reintroduction strategy. Obviously, we can't hold on to 24,000 tortoises forever. We want to get them back out in the wild. And so reintroduction sites, uh, we have to, you know, so select, carefully select reintroduction sites that are going to ensure these tortoises survival. We have put too much into sa saving these animals to risk putting them back out in, in harm's way. 
So we evaluate a number of factors. Community engagement is probably the most important. Do we have communities that really want to steward uh, a tortoise population? Is the habitat in good enough shape to support tortoises? Is there poacher access? We look for sites that are remote from large roads to where poachers uh, can't get in there. And we want to see if is a presence or absence of existing tortoise populations. We, we don't want to go putting tortoises back where there's a healthy population. Also, it was a combination of intense ground truthing. We use drone photography and follow-up surveys to allow us to key in on sites that have the highest potential for success. But local community engagement is really the most important aspect of this project. The, 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 the war, or is, the battle to save Madagascar's tortoises is gonna be won or lost at the community level. If the communities can't protect those animals, we're, we're fighting a losing battle. So wild populations will be created using what we call a soft release technique. So we build these large pre-release enclosures built in the native habitat. We put the tortoises in there for one year of time. Uh, and this, what this does is encourages site fidelity. So when you actually release the tortoises, knock the walls down of the pre-release enclosures, they have a strong tendency to remain in that area. Where if you just took them out and did a hard release, put them back out in a novel habitat, these tortoises don't know where they are. They don't recognize home and they just start wandering. So the psychedelic is really important. We were gonna get underway end of 2020. Obviously now we're delayed to 2021. Um, our long-term challenges, of course, maintaining 24,000 plus tortoises is expensive and challenging. It's, it's our largest country program. Our, that program consumes about 350,000 a year and employs over 50 staff members. We go through 11,000 kilograms of food per month. We buy this from local communities. Uh, we pay them to harvest and grow uh, greens for us, which you know, we, we try to support the local communities as much as we poss possibly can that are nearby our facilities. Um, we, uh, we, 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 we take security very serious. We, we pay a, a good security guard staff and we have uh, electronic surveillance at some of our high profile. Uh, facilities. So in the end, I want to thank everybody. We acknowledge all the organizations, those zoological institutions, uh, and citizens, individual donors, Madagascar staff, everybody that supported this project. We couldn't do it without you. Uh, and again, the zoo community, especially Seneca Park, has stepped up big over the last few years and has always helped us throughout this crisis. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to sincerely thank all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. Uh, amazing presentation. Uh, it certainly is incredible work that you're doing there. Um, you've answered most of the questions that uh, I had queued up for you, so hopefully we'll get some uh, from our audience. <clears throat> but uh, tell me a couple things. First of all, how large uh, does a population uh, have to be before, well, uh, how large does a uh, contiguous area population have to be before you consider it to be self-sustaining? I can't answer that. We've not defined those that at all. I mean, we obviously we want, there's a lot of rural habitat, sparsely habit, inhabited rural habitat in Madagascar. It's not hard to find uh, land to put tortoises. You just have to have communities that are supportive. And these communities all have forests associated with them that are may or may not be protected and so one of the things we found effective is to help them with the paperwork to get their forest designated as a community protected area it's not officially nationally protected but it's a community protected area where they have the authority to keep people out and so that's been effective we have um uh, tortoises radiated tortoise due to the introduced um Opuntia or prickly pear cactus can survive in areas where you wouldn't think a tortoise could make a living. All the na native vegetation has been is gone uh, due to slash burn and, and agriculture. But there's still this it, an abundance of prickly pear cactus, which the tortoises can subsist on. So tortoises are living in areas where they would normally not survive because of this introduced plant. It's kind of a double-edged sword, you know. You don't like the plant, but it, it provides a living for a lot of tortoises. So, um, you know, we haven't defined the size of a, of, a, of a designated protected area that we want to target. 
Okay, thank you again, Rick. Uh, next, we have uh, Ingrid Porton uh, telling us about the Madagascar Fauna and Flora Group. Take it away, Ingrid. So I want to begin by thanking Seneca Park for inviting us to be part of Party Mad. Seneca Park Zoo has been a loyal member of the MFG for 15 years and we, uh, 13 years, and we really appreciate your support. Our main primary research site is Batampoon National Reserve. It's a small remnant of rainforest on the east coast of Madagascar. Batampoon has a high diversity of both plant and animal species. Uh, for example, there are 83 species of frogs. There's 41 species of reptiles with another 13 waiting for genetic analysis. The 11 species of lemurs, three of them are considered critically endangered. Three of the species are endangered and the other five are vulnerable to extinction. We all know that habitat loss is the greater, greatest driver of population declines. Once habitat becomes smaller and smaller, these other threats, the impact of these other threats becomes increasingly serious. However, habitat fragmentation is a significant issue as it exacerbates habitat loss. This is because when habitats, a forest like Batampoon here, is isolated, there is no possibility of the normal process of offspringing dispersing from their natal group to find unrelated individuals. That process is blocked. As a result, the species lose, the population loses genetic diversity and becomes increasingly inbred. As a result, we need human-assisted gene flow. It's, we are unable to uh, plant corridors at this time. So um, we have initiated a project to translocate a group of diadema into Batampoon. To do this, we first have to get a handle on the population, as much information as we can. So Fidi Razumbainarivu, who is both a veterinarian and a PhD, has been managing the project on the ground. With our Batampoon team, he has tried to capture as many individuals as we can. Once they are captured, uh, we take genetics, uh, biological samples for health assessment, as well as analyzing the genetic diversity place radio collars on the individuals, and then release them, in which um, they are now being followed by two master's students who collected data on their home range in order to be able to map out where the individuals' groups are so that we know where we can place a new group. The result of the research is that um, we had five groups collared, um, two of the groups are single males, two of the groups are pairs, and there's one group of three, two females and a male. The students also, while they were tracking the animals, were able to find three new groups. This group over here has a pair and an offspring, and these two groups are pairs. You can see that the males do the most traveling. So gold and green are males. The total population then was eight males, seven females, and one unknown sex, which is the infant, a total of 16 individuals. In March of this year, Mr. Green over here found a female and a juvenile. This brings the total population up to 18. As you can see, 18 with one infant in there, the age pyramid is completely upside down. There's no recruitment into this population, and as a result, it is basically a dying population. So we were able to identify a source population at Ambatuvi, which is a mining site 
Um, however, as part of their commitment to maintaining the diversity of species um, found in the area, they are managing a conservation area where they are monitoring both the health of the lemur species that are found, which include many groups of diadema shifak. So Randy Youngi, a veterinarian from Columbus Zoo, and Kathy Williams from Duke University have been monitoring the health of these uh, lemurs for over eight years. In addition, removal of a group is not gonna impact, negatively impact the current population. In fact, they're a bit crowded, so it actually might be a good thing. In addition, we felt that locating and transporting a group from this site could be accomplished in a day, and thus we were moving forward with it. We applied for a permit to transfer the animals, um, we're well on our way, and then COVID-19 hit. What we hope that is in 2021, we'll be able to resume planning the translocation and we'll give you an update as we as it comes along. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, outstanding presentation. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, a couple of uh, questions uh, from the audience, and one of them is from uh, Carol Merker, Merkel, uh, and I'll just read that one out. When reforestation began in earnest, the goal was to create a connected forest along the eastern coast of Madagascar so the animals could move freely, thus reducing inbreeding and creating a more robust population. Is that goal still being sought? And Ingrid, could you uh, field that one for us? I don't know who was planning that. Hi, Carol, hope you're well. Um, I don't think anybody was planning a complete uh, corridor through the entire East Coast. What we've been doing is uh, many of the forests have a zone of protection around them, the uh, national parks, um, but Batam Poon never really had one, even though it was supposed to. So what we have been doing is trying to maintain a zone of protection by having communities help with reforesting that zone of protection. And that program has been going on since um, 2007. Um, we've also, I'm happy to say, um, invasive species, just like in the um, tortoise habitat, Invasive species are a real problems. So when invasive plants get into Batampoon, which they can through cyclones, clearing spaces, and Tavi, some has been burnt into the reserve, then they take a hold and they can start changing the structure of the forest, which is a real significant problem. So only this year, um, we've been able to get permission, well, last year, able to get permission to start doing some reforestation within the forest um, so that we can try and maintain a healthy primary forest. So um, we're really pleased about that part. And uh, how do the local uh, landowning families participate in this program? Um, yeah, I'm glad you brought it up that uh, they are actually own the land that was supposed to be the zone of protection. So um, they have no reason to participate. Uh, so what we have worked out, um, there were long negotiations with MNP, DREF, and um, MFG with the local communities on how we could develop a plan that helps them and helps the forest. Um, so basically came up with um, there are certain, uh, for example, we provide incentives. Um, so initially it was providing um, trees uh, that they could use for um, firewood reasons so they could plant endemic trees within the um, zone of protection and then other trees that would be used by them um, nearer to their homes. Um, and that program has changed over time. Now 
we have a um, conservation points system and um, if they accomplish so many things within the reforestation so they've planted they've nurtured the tree and it's growing well they earn points and from that there's a list of items that they can select uh, essentially buy with their conservation points um, and so uh, that's been popular and they just discussed again how they wanted to structure that program with local communities and they were very satisfied with the way it was and then every year they can select well these are items that we would like to um, have in the choice of items to select well thank you ingrid uh, now we'll move to our third panelist marcus feigler from zahana marcus go ahead please Aloha. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate at your virtual Madagascar 2020 event at the Zeneca Park Zoo. Allow me to introduce you to Zahana, a Malagasy nonprofit working in the high plateau of Madagascar, some five to six hours drive north of the capital of Antananarive. We are guided by the philosophy of integrative participatory development, which I know is quite a mouthful. But the participatory part means you ask the community what do you need the most, what are your priorities, and how can we together try to achieve your goals. The integrative part means that we are addressing all the issues at the same time. Be it access to clean water, a school, microcredit, reforestation, or improving cookstoves, all issues are addressed in tandem because they are interrelated. At our humble beginnings in 2005, the community's priority number one was access to clean, safe water. In true participatory fashion, they built their own water system themselves, working side by side with the water technicians who lived in the village for two months digging trenches and laying pipes. The community-built water system has been flowing uninterrupted now for almost 15 years, which I may add is quite unique for development projects. We use the same approach for our schools. But the main focus of this presentation is reforestation. For over 10 years, Zahana has been employing by now three gardeners, one in each village, to grow seedlings for reforestation and introduce new crops. Most people in the West, when they hear Madagascar, think of lemurs and deforestation. But if you live there, trees disappear gradually because you need firewood to cook. But how do you convince rice farmers to become tree planters? As an incentive, we promised an award to the three most successful reforesters, knowing all too well that none of these poor rural farmers have ever received an award for anything. But our award had a twist. In the first, second and third year, three people got an award for the largest number of trees planted that actually survived. The first year had the smallest, the second almost twice as much, but the biggest price was in the third year for the most trees planted that were still growing after three or more years. The award ceremony actually took place during the visit of the Minister of Health for the inauguration of our health center. Upscaling our reforestation, we moved the tree nursery from our gardener's backyard into the school grounds in 2019. More space allowed growing more seedlings to meet the higher demand. But it also allowed us to involve the students hands-on in the growing and taking care of tree seedlings. Watering the seedlings has become a fun game for the students every day and has become a part of their curriculum. In 2019, we teamed up with a group from a local college that developed an improved cookstove. Their cookstove can be built exclusively with locally made resources, where nothing needs to be bought from the outside. One of the participants summarized it beautifully and said, Firewood that lasted for a week now lasts for four if you use an improved cookstove. Reducing the need for firewood protects, protects trees more than anything else. But there is a twist. To qualify for a workshop on building an improved cookstove in your community, 
the community has to commit to reforestation. The seedlings provided by our gardeners need to be planted first to show to the team that the community is serious. Combining reforestation with improved cookstoves that actually work, because you made it yourself, is by far the most ambitious project to date. Currently already six villages in the surrounding areas have been included, therefore expanding Zahana's reforestation efforts way beyond our initial villages. Thank you very much. Marcus, that was... Talk to uh, you soon. <laughs> Marcus, that was absolutely uh, brilliant. <clears throat> so, um, you are employing local gardeners in Madagascar to actually uh, reestablish the forests. Is this... Um, are more people signing on to this as the... Uh, organization shows its uh, successes? Yeah, em employing the gardeners actually was one of our key strategies, if I look back. Originally, we had found one gardener who was trained and then the NGO that trained him went defunct and he was basically sitting around and he approached us. And in good sort of early stages we thought okay we employ him and then he grows some seedlings and does some stuff and then he becomes an entrepreneur and he can start selling his seedlings he can live off that and that didn't really work out he said thank you very much but i don't want to sell stuff to my friends and my neighbors and i'd rather go back to rice farming so we looked into ourselves and into our budget and we decided to just hire him and that proved to be very effective. So we now have people in the villages that grow seedlings that they give away to people who want to plant trees. And it has grown exponentially over the years. So having, and, and it's, it's very interesting because a lot of people see what kind of varieties of trees do you plant? And we say we plant anything the gardeners want. Because now it happens that somebody said, you know, I went to my cousin's village and there was this beautiful tree and I really liked it. And there were a couple of seeds lying around and I brought them for you. And then he tries to grow them. And if they grow fine and if they don't, well, then they didn't. So it's all sort of trial and error and, and stuff that gets brought in. And um, what, uh, what kind of quantities of uh, trees are we talking about? You know, how many did you actually put in the ground, say, in 2019? That's a really difficult question to answer because our gardeners keep really meticulous records and they send me beautiful pictures because Malagasy's are really good in bookkeeping. And then he has his little, literally, he has a booklet where he writes down whatever Len got seven trees, three of this one and three of that one and one of that one. And then we learned the biggest challenge we have, and that's probably all across Madagascar, is brush fires. Because people put the, the, mainly the dry grass on fire because it's much easier. And then they think they clean out the pasture. And our estimate is that we are losing a large amount of trees to fires. And one does not talk about the fire because one never sets the fire. It's always the other people over there who set the fire. It's never us. Our village has never, ever done this. And so it's this really gray area. But I, when, when I went there, I went to, the garden, went to one of our gardeners and I showed him this picture. And I said, you know, I have this picture. It's also in there. He is having this box under his arm in the video. And then he took me there. There are not as many trees as he planted, but there are probably 20 or 30 out of the 150 he planted left. Mm -hmm. So we hope that we planted a couple of thousand trees. I've seen whole patches of trees where when I asked the gardener in the other village who planted it, he proudly looked at me and said, <laughs> okay. so it's a very gradual process. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you, Marcus. 
Uh, <clears throat> next, we'll uh, uh, have uh, Darlene Benson, <clears throat> uh, who will uh, talk about the uh, three organizations being supported. Um, okay, there's actually, we started out with two, which was the Ranamapan with uh, Dr. Patricia Wright and the MFG. Um, but we've been doing this now for 17 years. This is our 17th uh, party Madagascar. And um, it's changed over the years. We've added several different um, organizations that we are helping and um, just trying to grow, uh, grow what we've been doing. Of course, this year made it a little more difficult because usually we have a big party right at the zoo and have a huge marketplace and, and events. And uh, as you can see from this picture, uh, we've had speakers, uh, Pat Wright and Eric Patel. Um, these were, this was a class uh, from Rochester who made these pillowcases for use in Madagascar to catch the lemurs as they were being um, caught to, to look at them medically and then of course let back into the forest. Um, they did a pen pal exchange with some students in Madagascar. Um, so we're always looking for new ways to add to what we've been doing. Um, it started is um, from the conservation committee, we were looking for some way to support animals in the wild and uh, be partially again because of Pat Wright and uh, Dr. Jeff Wyatt was already working with her and we had several different animals from Madagascar at the zoo. Uh, we had been doing a Discover Madagascar Day for several years before we started the party. And um, two of our docents, uh, Chris Greeley and Anne Marie Toby, went to the Columbus Zoo for their Rwanda FET, which is where we um, got the idea to have a party and uh, a FET so that we could raise money. And uh, it's been fairly, it's been very successful. We've been really happy with it. Yes, it's. Uh... It certainly has been very successful over the years. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, add that uh, the Dosen organization is a group of the most amazing, hardworking people you will ever meet in your <laughs> entire life. Uh, totally volunteers. Um, they uh, uh, support the mission of the Seneca Park Zoo Society, the education mission, and uh, the uh, uh, party mad that they have been putting on, uh, raising money for these uh, organizations is totally uh, an endeavor uh, of the docent organization done with volunteer labor. Uh, they are uh, supported by the Seneca Park Zoo Society, but this is a task that uh, the docents take on and they have raised an amazing amount of money for uh, organizations in Madagascar over the years. It's been a privilege to be able to attend the parties for many years and uh, donate to that organization. I strongly encourage uh, people uh, watching this presentation today to uh, make donations so that the Dosen organization can continue to support uh, the fabulous uh, organizations that you've seen uh, present to us today. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we have some questions uh, that I'm going to, uh, uh, to field out. And the uh, first one is from last night's moderator, Jeff Wyatt. And uh, this one is for Rick. Have you identified opportunities for local communities to access alternative protein sources to the tortoises? Well, two of the communities where we work, where, where our tortoise centers are, we employ um, local villagers there to serve as keepers as well as security guards. They've all been well trained and, uh, provide, you know, they're the only people in their communities that really have 
paying jobs. Um, the, we provide access to clean water for these communities. Both, both tortoise centers have wells and part of our relationship with the community is to provide them access to, to fresh water. We also pay the local people to grow uh, sweet potato vine and other, uh, and to collect local vegetation to feed tortoises. We're going through a lot of food and it's particularly challenging when there are, is a drought situation. And so, um, but we managed to get by and they are these, we, we provide income to, to, a lot of, to a lot of communities. Um, the tortoise consumption is not, per se, is not, the, the areas where we work in the Mahafal and the Tanjuri regions in the central core of the range where the tortoises are still hanging on, um, those cultures don't consume tortoises, but they, the, the, the strength of their protective taboo runs hot to cold. Some will protect the tortoises vigorously and not let outside tribes in to poach others will turn a blind eye or take a payoff to let poachers in. So it's what we have to do is really go in and incentivize their, uh, their participation. And fortunately, all communities that we've worked with, when we've asked them what they've wanted, they've all said a school. And so, you know, we, we had never been in the school building business until about five years ago, we built our first school. It really served as a regional model for the, the, the power of protecting tortoises, how this is how a community can really strongly benefit from protecting tortoises. We found one community in particular that we drove through and we stopped to photograph tortoises and they immediately came out and questioned us, asked what we're doing. And we kind of realized that something was going on there. And the more we got to know them, the more we realized that, you know, they saw the tortoise as the embodiment of their ancestors and they were very protective. So we decided that was a good place to, to, to create this school with, as a regional model. All the local politicians came out and extolled the, the, the values of, uh, of protecting tortoises. And it's been a big success, but we, we want to continue that model throughout, uh, especially with the communities that we're targeting for reintroductions, right? We have two, two communities now that are targeted for 2021, and we've got a hit list of about 10 others where we really need to get in and start developing community relations. We've got staff, uh, devoted to um, community outreach and, and community um, cultivation. So we're, we're optimistic that um, we're, we're going to find a model that works for the next couple of years. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Marcus from Charles Welch. Any comments on reforestation using drones in Madagascar as is currently planned? <laughs> That's a really good question. I think drone is a very high tech solution that sort of brings all these other problems with them. Like for example, how do you recharge your battery if you have no electricity, then you need to bring in solar. And the, it, hopefully one day in the future, we can introduce a technology like that. At the moment, our drones are called feet. The gardener says, where did you plant the trees? And he or she takes you there and you just walk there and you do a good old uh, visual inspection. You look, you say, I gave you 10 seedlings and where are these 10 trees? Okay, three survived, boom. Then you get, gave him 10 seedlings, three survived, Len was semi-successful. Okay, um, another question uh, again from Marcus. Uh, from Pamela Reed Sanchez. Can you talk about how a good source of, uh, excuse me, how a source of good water has directly benefited the town? I'm smiling because this is my favorite question and I do not know Pam, this is not a plant. <laughs> in, we built our water system in 2006 and it's a community built water system. So the community built it and they're very proud of it that they own it. They lay the pipes, but that's a different issue. In the past, and that's why this is my favorite question. In the past, before we started, between 30 to 50 children died in the Epoque Dure, which is sort of the dry season before you plant the rice. So you have basically nothing to eat anymore. And in, in French, Malagasy, it's called the Epoque Dure. Up to 50 children died in the village. Since we have a clean water system, and this is now, let me think, 14 years, no child has died. 
not of waterborne diseases, not of other diseases. No child has died, period. And that's why we are so proud of our clean water system. Because personally, and yes, I'm supposed to talk about reforestation here. I'm very aware of that. I think the single biggest bang for the buck is to give people, regardless where they live, access to clean water. Public health has proven this in London in the 1890s with the cholera. It is, it is very clear. Give people access to clean water and you can get rid of 80% of the problems that plague a community. That's my personal belief. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, this question again from Pamela Reed Sanchez is for all. So let's take this in, in uh, the order, uh, Rick, Ingrid, and Marcus. Uh, first to Rick, we are all in need, we all need signs of hope, especially now. What do you see that gives you hope for the biodiversity of Madagascar? You know, it's, I've been in this business a long time and I wouldn't keep, I wouldn't keep, I don't fight losing battles. I know this is a battle that we can win. And I know that by building support at the community level, um, you know, we can do this. It's just a matter of marshalling the resources to the right, to the right place at the right time. And it's, it's going to take a, uh, a lot of, a lot of effort, but it's, it's, it's one community at a time. And I know we can do this. And I see signs of hope every time I'm there. I mean, Yes, the habitat condition gets worse, but there are so many people committed to Madagascar right now. And when once you get to know the people of Madagascar and see that the strength of their resolve and all it takes is a little provision of resources to to inspire them, you know, it gives you hope. And so I know we're gonna we, we can we're gonna lose a lot, but we're gonna save a lot um, at the, through community engagement. Thank you, Ingrid. I think one thing that uh, gives me a bit of hope is seeing um, women as they gain more rights in Madagascar. I think it's uh, if women are more involved, if women become uh, part of the government, more decision makers, if women can have control of their own lives, um, I think that helps nature. That's encouraging to me. But I actually just want to say that I don't think it's just a Madagascar problem. I think it is a worldwide issue. So I think if people are actually committed to protecting species around the world, it's, it, Madagascar can't do it by itself. There's pressures from the outside world on Madagascar. And I think it really takes, um, a change in moral, um, a moral obligation to protect wildlife throughout the world. And um, as we see some of the movements going on now um, with people uh, pressing for their rights, I think that gives me a bit of hope that it's gonna be extended to species of the world too. Thank you, Ingrid. And Marcus? Well, the answer is for me twofold. One, one thing that gives me great hope is reforestation. And we have moved our nursery that was at the gardener's house into the schoolyard so that the school children can get involved in reforestation. And when, when we were there visiting, a, a friend of mine joined me on the trip to Madagascar and he's also a journalist and he interviewed our founder and he said, what's the plan? And we want to plant 15,000 trees. Why 15,000? Because we have roughly 1,500 people. Each, people. each person plants 10 trees. Everybody loves numbers. That's how we come up with 15,000. And she very nonchalantly said, oh, we just committed that every year, every student is going to plant five trees. And if I would have been sitting on a chair, I would have fallen off my chair. And I'm like, how did you come with, up with this idea? And she said, well, that's why we moved the nursery next to the school so the kids can get involved with reforestation and it becomes normal. And I was like, wow, that if you grow up and planting trees is a normal thing, maybe it goes mainstream. The second thing, and that's why it's twofold for me personally, which gives me a lot of hope, are these improved cookstoves. 
because if you use improved cook stoves and you can on a theoretical level reduce the need for firewood by 75 percent it eases the pressure to produce firewood in the first place so for me introducing a cook stove that finally works and i don't want to down, put down any other ngos but there are hundreds of ngos working in improved cook stoves there are very cool examples out there with usb drives and uh, with usb plug-ins to sort of collect the data it's amazing what's out there but our model seems to work because it's a local solution developed by local people implemented on a local level and if we really get everybody to just use these improved cook stoves, we have already reduced the need for firewood by 75%. That gives me a tremendous amount of hope. I find this the most exciting project we have embarked on in the last 15 years on a very personal level. Okay, thank you. Uh, brilliant answers to the uh, questions and certainly uh, gives me hope uh, for the future. Uh, I have a question for uh, all of you, and let's take this in the order of uh, Ingrid, Marcus, and Rick. So first to Ingrid. The question uh, is, to what extent uh, is the Malagasy government uh, helping or hindering uh, your uh, efforts? We have a very good relationship with Madagascar National Parks. They manage Batamkun. Um, they have a, very, a new, relatively new director, a woman, by the way, um, who's very dynamic, and we have a very good partnership with them. So, for example, um, they develop a plan for Batamkun and uh, the three most critically endangered lemur species are priorities. So we've worked very closely with them. We're their research partner. So we provide data and provide suggestions and um, they are the authority that allows it to move forward as well as um, the Ministry of the Environment. So DREF and MEF, um, no, DREAD now. Um, so we work very closely with the Malagasy government um, in a variety of projects, actually. But yes, um, we have a good relationship with them. Thank you. Marcus? Talking about politics in Madagascar, the easiest always is to take the fifth. <laughs> but uh, I, I was thinking of one example. The, new very dynamic and i always have to be careful we call him obama because he reminds us of looking like president obama the new director of health of the region where we are in came to the inauguration of our school and really liked the project and is on a personal level a very big supporter of our approaches and the reason why i'm smiling is he made this mistake he said oh this reforestation in the schools is a really cool idea so the next time our founder visited him, she stopped along the road and bought a couple of tree seedlings, showed up in his office and said, by the way, I brought some trees that we could plant in front of your office because there are no trees there. And all of a sudden, the director of education is sort of with a shovel in his hand in the next picture and they're digging a hole and they're planting trees. Because she said, you know, if he is supportive on sort of an intellectual level, we also need to put this into practice. And this is sort of how we try to foster relationships with government officials that we say, come and see what we do and maybe we can rope you in, in thinking. And this is sort of the dangerous part in encouraging them to think differently about the development of their own country. It's sort of, come look what we are doing you can out of your own means develop something that and that's a dangerous part questions the status quo because the poverty level all of us have seen in madagascar is still sort of soul choking okay thank you marcus and rick well the tsa has been very fortunate in the in having the head of our program, Harry Lala Randria Mahezu, is a, a long time kind of a operator in Madagascar. He's worked for WCS for many years previously and um, 
has is can walk into just about any government office and get an audience. And he's very effective. He's very well spoken. Uh, speaks French, English, and Malagasy. He is able to to get things done and cut through the bureaucracy. And he can usually get a get an audience with the head of any of the ministers, any of the ministries that he that he wants. And so we work closely with Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Education. Uh, as well as the uh, various gendarmes and enforcement people in various regions. And I think they appreciate what we do. There's several times we've, you know, been accused of doing their job for them and because we, we apprehend poachers and, and detain them until their gendarmes get there. We have to pay their gendarmes to per diem to come and do their job. We have to provide them transportation. You know, there's a lot of areas of dysfunctionality within the Malagasy government. And so if you shore up some of those areas and, and help them do their job, they're, uh, they're appreciative. And so um, we, we've been able to, to get done just about everything we want to get done. We've had no major obstacles. Um, right now, we're, we've, we've just submitted a, a large uh, $2 million grant to INL to work on improving enforcement uh, capacity and and getting some consistency in the judicial process and how these laws are applied, and uh, if we and they, and they we so we had to get a lot of letters of support from various ministries, and uh, and get their you know get their sign on and uh, you know, commitment to attend the workshops and participate, and uh, it was not a, it was not a challenge. They were very uh, happy to participate. So. I hope we get those funds. I think it's going to go a long way to improving the uh, the judicial process as well as enforcement. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, excellent answers. I'm glad that uh, you all have uh, an opinion on this. We have time for one last question, and Jeff Wyatt says the system change Ingrid mentioned in how the global community prioritizes saving ecosystems is most needed. And his question, how may zoos around the world help influence that change in meaningful ways? Anyone who has an opinion is welcome to answer. I'm happy to say something. Um, obviously education, um, that's important. Um, but I also think that zoos have an incredible opportunity to support conservation in the country. Um, sustaining support, so select a few projects that your zoo can afford and provide sustaining support. Because writing grants, we all do that, we go to foundations, but those are not sustaining. Um, so sustaining support where we can employ people, uh, MFG employs over 50 Malagasy. Um, so we have a pretty good payroll um, and that takes sustaining support. So grants provide you some uh, money for that, uh, especially for the uh, seeing out of a project, but basic salary support so that your program can progress from year to year to year. I think zoos have, are in a position to be able to do that um, like no other uh, organization I can think of. I have to agree with that. The, uh, the TSA gets a lot of support from the zoo community and especially in times of crisis, the zoo community is really uniquely positioned to step up and, and help with that. They have vets and keepers and carpenters and technicians. I mean, they can mobilize a lot of resources. And so um, that's been important. The, the downside of our dependence on the zoo community, I'm about a good portion of our annual operating budget comes from zoos, especially Madagascar. Well, zoos right now are, are in survival mode. They are not uh, devoting a lot of resources to conservation. They're trying to survive, keep their staff employed. So we are conservatively estimating a 65% decrease in zoo funding for this year. So we are struggling to keep our project afloat. We are, uh, we've got a contract with the USAID that should kick in soon. That'll help keep our tortoise centers open through 2020 uh, with staff um, paid, but beyond 2020, the, the future is um, in the hands of COVID. I would just, if I may say something. Go ahead. Um, 
I totally agree with Rick that um, this year is going to be a tough one for Zeus, but it's, I hope, somewhat unique. Um, I mean, this is, you know, every sector of the, of uh, the communities are being affected. So businesses and everything. So um, I still think <laughs> that zoos um, do have an opportunity because of sustaining funding um, to be able to keep NGOs in Madagascar working. Yep. Uh, also for me, as being the youngest kid on the block here, <laughs> it, is, it is funny, my friends, I got a lot of blank stares when I talked about the zoo meeting we have at the moment. And they say, why is a zoo in Rochester, New York, supporting your little NGO in Madagascar? And I thought about it and my answer was, think about it. what do you love in the zoo? You love the lemurs. Everybody talks about the lemurs in the zoo here in Honolulu. What do lemurs need? Lemurs need trees. There is the connection. Trees, if we have no trees, you have no, ah, now I see. And at the same time, I know everybody is impacted by COVID-19. So are the zoos very heavily because they've been closed for the longest time. And now we have very strict rules. And I saw you in Rochester also, you have to buy your ticket online. And it's very complicated to sort of visit a zoo. And that also applies to Madagascar. I just counted. We have only nine employees because we are a small NGO, but we are paying their salaries. And the teachers are doing nothing because the government in the infinite wisdom has closed all the schools. Who is actually benefiting from it the most is our gardening project because the teachers have nothing to do. So they teamed up with the gardeners and they now help growing a huge school garden that in the future will benefit for the nutrition of the school. And they're assisting with all this stuff, which happen to be thousands of tree seedlings that are there. So it's a match made in heaven, but we need to guarantee these salaries because these people live off that salary. They're not farmers. And if we don't pay them, they either leave or they starve. Fine, uh, awesome answers. Thank you all. Uh, Anne, you want to put up the final slide? Uh, thank you to uh, all of our presenters today. Uh, thank you for all the participants uh, who have come. And uh, uh, I would like to pipe in on one last thing here because what is missing from our virtual party Madagascar is beer. <laughs> Typically it's a 21 and over event. And one way we were talking about how zoos can still support these conservation projects, even when a lot of places are closed or struggling right now. At the Seneca Park Zoo, we have reopened and we're very excited about that. But a way for you to support conservation projects in Madagascar, like the ones that we've seen tonight, is by buying this special beer. So Stoneyard Brewing is putting out a specially labeled peach cult that you can see on the screen right there. It will be available starting mid next week. And we have a few of local businesses that will be selling it and that will only expand from there as the time goes on. So keep your eyes out for that. And every time you purchase this beer, you're helping us support these projects in Madagascar. So we're definitely trying to get creative and do as much as we can to help channel some of our funding into these conservation projects, even while we work to keep our own business afloat too. And of course we do have those couple of ways for you to donate or shop. We have some of our Madagascar goods that you'd normally find at our marketplace when you are on grounds that are available through our online format right now. So those links are in the chat and of course you can also donate directly and for every $25 donation a tree will be planted in Madagascar in your honor. So there's a few really awesome ways that you can from Rochester, New York or wherever you're watching help us support our conservation projects in Madagascar too. So I'd like to thank everybody so much for being a part of it tonight. Ingrid, Marcus, Rick, Darlene, thank you so much for being our panelists. And Len, thank you so much for moderating tonight. We really appreciate your support and your involvement in everything. Happy to do it. Uh, participants, um, please uh, click on the chat control and uh, click on the live link before you close uh, Zoom out. Uh, so that you have that ready to uh, make a donation uh, so that we can continue to support these fine organizations. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye.